In this video, I will be given an introductory lecture discussing a short summary of the life of the ancient Greek philosopher Plato. In future lectures, I will be discussing specifically many of Plato's major ideas, which he put forth and discussed during his life, and this include in the fields metaphysics, epistemology, aesthetics, ethics, and political philosophy. Plato is perhaps the most famous philosopher which has ever existed and has had a ginormous effect on the Western world and tradition. Plato is the second of the trio of ancient Greeks, including Socrates and Aristotle, said to have laid the philosophical foundations of Western culture. The English mathematician, philosopher and lay theologian Alfred North Whitehead once famously claimed, the safest general characterization of the European philosophical tradition is that it consists of a series of footnotes to Plato. Much is unknown about the early life of Plato. This is due to a lack of surviving accounts. The exact time and place of Plato's birth are uncertain, but it is widely accepted that Plato was born in 428 to 427 BC and died at the age of 80 or 81 at 348 or 347 BCE. It is certain that he belonged to an aristocratic and influential family. His father was called Ariston, who may have traced his descent from Codrus, the last of the legendary kings of Athens. His mother was called Perisotoni. She was supposedly descended from the famous Athenian lawmaker and poet Solon, and whose family also boasted prominent figures of the oligarchical regime of Athens known as the Thirty Tyrants. Both sides of the family claimed to trace their ancestry back to Poseidon. He had two brothers, Adamantus and Glaucon, and a sister, Portone. After his father's death, Plato's mother married her uncle, with whom she had another son, Antiphon, Plato's half-brother. Plato later introduced several of his distinguished relatives into his dialogues. This indicates a considerable family pride. Plato's actual given name was apparently Aristocles, after his grandfather. Plato seems to have started as a nickname for Platos or Broad, perhaps first given to him by his wrestling teacher for his physique, or for the breadth of his style, or even the breadth of his forehead. Although the name Aristocles was still given as Plato's name on one of the two epitaphs on his tomb, history still knows him as Plato. From ancient sources which we have discovered, they describe Plato as a bright, though modest boy, who excelled in his studies. His father contributed all which was necessary to give to his son a good education, and, therefore, Plato must have been instructed in many different academic subjects. This include philosophy, grammar, music, and even gymnastics, taught by some of the most distinguished teachers of his era. A major event Plato experienced was the Peloponnesian War between Athens and Sparta. Plato was in military service from 409 to 404 BC, and, for a time, he imagined a life in public affairs for himself. The defeat of Athens ended its democracy, which the Spartans replaced with an oligarchy. The notorious Thirty Tyrants' brief rule severely reduced the rights of Athenian citizens. Plato was invited to join the administration of the regime of the Thirty Tyrants through the connection with his uncle Charmides, who was himself a member, but he was soon repelled by their violent acts and backed out. In 403 BC, the oligarchy was overthrown and democracy was restored to Athens, and Plato had renewed hopes of entering politics again, although the excesses of Athenian political life in general persuaded him to hold back. There were many intellectual influences on Plato. Three pre-Socratic philosophers had a big effect on Plato. The philosophers were Pythagoras, Heraclitus, and Parmenides. In future lectures, I will be going into more detail about their lives and about these philosophers' metaphysical ideas 
and how each of them influenced Plato's thinking heavily and how they relate to his work. The person who had the greatest influence on Plato's life and work was Socrates. Socrates' methods of dialogue and debate impressed Plato so much that he soon became a close associate and dedicated his life to the question of virtue and the formation of a noble character. The precise relationship between Plato and Socrates remains an area of contention among scholars. Plato makes it clear in his Apology of Socrates that he was a devoted young follower of Socrates. In that dialogue, Socrates is presented as mentioning Plato by name as one of those youths close enough to him to have been corrupted. If he were in fact guilty of corrupting the youth and questioning why their fathers and brothers did not step forward to testify against him if he indeed was guilty of such a crime. The execution of Socrates in 399 BC had a profound effect on Plato and he decided to have nothing further to do with politics in Athens. As Alan James Ryan said, with the trial of Socrates, the history of Western political thinking begins. Socrates' death sparked off Plato's astonishing philosophical career. After Socrates' tragic death, he joined a group of Socratic disciples who had gathered in the Greek city of Megara under the leadership of Euclid of Megara before leaving and travelling quite widely to places like Italy, Sicily, Egypt and Cyrene. When Plato returned to Athens around 387 or 385 BC, Plato founded the Academy. This was one of the earliest and most famous organised schools in Western civilization, and the prototype for later universities. It was on a plot of land containing a sacred grove just outside the city walls of ancient Athens. The garden had historically been home to many other groups and activities. It had once been home to religious groups with its grove of oil trees dedicated to Athena, the goddess of wisdom, war and crafts. Later the garden was named for Academos, a local hero after which the academy was named. This is where we get the words academy and academia from. Ultimately the garden was left to the citizens of Athens for use as a gymnasium. The garden was surrounded by art, architecture and nature as it was famously adorned with statues, sepulchres, temples and olive trees. Plato delivered his lectures there in the small grove where senior and junior members of the exclusive group of intellectuals met. It has been surmised that these meetings and teachings employed several methods including lectures, seminars and even dialogue, but primary instruction would have been conducted by Plato himself. Plato's academy was not a formal school or college in the sense we're familiar with. Rather, it was more of an informal society of intellectuals who shared a common interest in studying subjects such as philosophy, mathematics and astronomy. Plato had been bitterly disappointed with the standards displayed by those in public office and his intention was to train young men in philosophy and the sciences in order to create better statesmen, as well as to continue the work of his former teacher, Socrates. Among Plato's most noteworthy students at the academy were Aristotle, Xenocrates, Sepusippus, and Theophrastus. Except for two more trips to Sicily, the academy seems to have been Plato's home base for the remainder of his life. Plato presided over his academy from 387 BC until his death in 347 BC, aged about 80. He was supposedly buried in the school grounds, although his grave has never been discovered. On Plato's death, his nephew, Sepusippus, succeeded him as head of the school. This is perhaps because his star pupil, Aristotle's ideas, had by that time diverged too far from Plato's. Plato is perhaps the first philosopher whose complete works are still available to us. He wrote no systematic treatises given his views, but rather he wrote a number of superb dialogues written in the form of conversations, a form which permitted him to develop the Socratic method of question and answer. In his dialogues, 
Plato discussed every kind of philosophical idea, including ethics, metaphysics, political philosophy, philosophy of religion, epistemology, the philosophy of mathematics, and the theory of art. None of the dialogues actually contain Plato himself as a character, and so he does not actually declare that anything asserted in them are specifically his own views. The characters in the dialogues are generally historical, with Socrates usually as the protagonist, particularly in the early dialogues. It is generally thought that the views expressed by the character of Socrates in Plato's dialogues were views that Socrates himself actually held, and the works had the effect of gradually rehabilitating Socrates' rather tarnished image among the Athenians in the wake of his death. As time went on though, the dialogues began to deal more with subjects that interested Plato himself, rather than merely providing a vehicle for the ideas of Socrates. It seems likely that Plato's main intention in his dialogues was more to teach his students to think for themselves and to find their own answers to the big questions, rather than to blindly follow his own opinions or those of Socrates. We have no material evidence about exactly when Plato wrote each of his dialogues, nor the extent to which some might have been later revised or rewritten, nor even whether all or part of them were ever published or made widely available. In addition to the ideas they contained, his writings are also considered superb pieces of literature in their own right, in terms of the mastery of language, the power of indicating character, the sense of situation, and the keen eye for both tragic and comic aspects. There is no denying that Plato led a very interesting and even admirable life for a man living in ancient Greece. His philosophy, as I have already mentioned, has influenced most of Western philosophy that came after him, and even laid the foundations of Western science. In addition to being a foundational figure for Western science, philosophy and mathematics, Plato has often been cited as one of the founders of Western religion and spirituality. In the 19th century, the philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche criticised Christianity by saying, it's Platonism for the people. I will close this introductory biographical lecture by reading a passage from the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy discussing Plato. One of the most dazzling writers in the Western literary tradition and one of the most penetrating, wide-ranging and influential authors in the history of philosophy. He was not the first thinker or writer to whom the word philosopher should be applied, but he was so self-conscious about how philosophy should be conceived and what its scope and ambitions properly are, and he so transformed the intellectual currents with which he grappled that the subject of philosophy as it is often conceived, a rigorous and systematic examination of ethical, political, metaphysical and epistemological issues, armed with a distinctive method, can be called his invention. Few other authors in the history of Western philosophy approximate him in depth and range. Perhaps only Aristotle, who studied with him, Aquinas and Kant would be generally agreed to be of the same rank.